this year marks a centenary uh, for St George's, which arguably um, should never really have been a centenary in the first place. Um, because it was in 1916 that the first women graduated from this university. It's, as I said, a, a centenary that one might argue shouldn't need to be celebrated because um, the concept of women in medicine actually predates the Christian era by quite a long time. I'm sure uh, most of you will be familiar with the names of Hippocrates and Galen. Uh, you may, however, be less familiar with this lady, Metrodora, the author of a surprisingly detailed work on obstetrics and gynaecology entitled On the Diseases and Cures of Women. Um, but she's not well known, and arguably not because of any lack in the work that she and many other women doctors did, but rather because it was the uh, early, uh, in early Christian times, under the tutelage of St. Paul, that it became established that women could not make an authoritative uh, contribution. It was deemed unhelpful and incompatible with biblical teaching. In reality, it wasn't, as we shall see later, but in a time when most people were largely uneducated and relied on priests and learned priests and scribes to interpret the Bible for them, the message could get, shall we say, selected. So, um, St. Paul, a road to uh, his conversion. And uh, in the first uh, book, of uh, Timothy chapter 2 verse 12 he says I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man she must be silent and for nearly 2,000 years when it came to what might now be called social policy it was the writ of St Paul that ran free in most of the Western world women were considered subordinate to men and the idea of emancipation or equality was really seldom entertained at least by men and those wishing to maintain this status quo need only to point to the quoted verse and mutter darkly about change being against the natural order. So most of you will be familiar with the story of the fall of Alexandria and the sacking of the library there, which effectively erased from Western awareness a lot of knowledge of the ancient world, which had become politically inconvenient, like Metrodora. Um, the sack of the Great Library was often blamed on Christians uh, and indeed some scientific and social concepts that were, uh, shall we say, inconvenient to the Christian um, theology of the time uh, were amongst those which disappeared. But in reality the truth is probably that there were many different groups that had multiple agendas who all bore some responsibility and the effect was that large swathes of our knowledge of the ancient world and indeed their knowledge of medicine at the time uh, passed out of awareness for many generations. Now fortunately as we now know it wasn't actually lost because in fact most of the discoveries that these texts contained had already moved eastwards under the influence of the emerging Islamic civilizations who took them uh, to, into their culture and uh, under the work of notable physicians such as Razes and Ibn Sina, um, returned them eventually with interest. Uh, Razes was a paediatrician. He was the first man to diagnose uh, German measles. Um, and uh, Ibn Sina uh, was sometimes known as Avicenna to Western medicine, uh, d did uh, very fundamental work on uh, categorizing diseases and the famous canon of Avicenna is one of the seminal works of medical history. Um, but via the thrust of the Islamic civilizations up into Spain with the Moors, the information that they had uh, taken east with them was returned to the Western world at the start of the Renaissance with considerable interest. 
and the founding of the medical schools in Bologna, Padua and Montpellier uh, be began a new beginning for, for what we now know as Western medicine. And the schools didn't, of course, pr practice scientific medicine in the way that we would understand it today. They relied on the ancient texts from these libraries. And the thing about that was that most of these libraries were controlled by the church. And to be a scholar of the library, you had first to be a reverend, ordained minister. And of course, they were all men. So the, the reverend doctors were all men. Um, and the interesting thing about that is another little aside here. I'm slightly digressing. Um, that, of course, is the origin also of the, the rift that grew up between surgery and medicine. Because in order to be a surgeon in those days, before asepsis and anesthesia, there was a very good chance that if you were going to operate on your patient, you would probably kill them. And you couldn't have somebody who was effectively a mass murderer having holy orders. So the church decided they didn't really want anything to do with surgery, and hence surgeons became a breed apart. And thus was born the slight change of title that, that between a surgeon who was mister and a, a doctor. <laughs> but that's, I'm digressing. Of course, the church didn't, wasn't completely male-dominated. There were some who made a contribution to medicine, some women. Uh, I wonder how, if any of you are familiar with this lady, Hildegard of Bingen, who, um, Susan told me, um, was actually a very accomplished musician, um, as well as a medic. Um, now, she wrote um, two uh, works. The first, Physica, contained nine books that described the scientific um, and medicinal properties of various plants, fish, reptiles and animals, and just anything she could find. And Causa et Curae, uh, which was an exploration of the human body and its connections to the rest of the natural world. So, very early work on diagnostics, effectively. So it could be argued that when it came, the change in culture uh, began as an unintentional consequence of the Industrial Revolution, because the vast labour requirements of places like the cotton mills uh, meant that um, the employment of women became a, a necessity. And with that, women began to acquire income in their own right. And with that came the first stirrings of discontent with the status quo. And it, it always strikes me as slightly ironic that given the, the, the precise wording from St Paul that I started with, that one of the very first uh, professions to be opened to women fully was teaching. <laughs> and uh, in fact, uh, by about 19... Um, 11, about 14% were women teachers. Uh, so uh, it wasn't long before, of course, women were aspiring to other professions as well. And my own ancestor, who you can see here, uh, Charlotte Angus Scott, was one such, and she had a, a uh, battle royal to uh, graduate as one of the first doctors of science in the field of mathematics and specifically geometry from Girton College, Cambridge. Um, and uh, that, of course, that struggle and the knowledge of that struggle within the family is one of the things that interests me in this aspect of the history of medicine. So uh, now I'm going to get a little, you to do a little bit of work because I've talked enough for a bit. Who are these two? Anybody? Oh, there's no prizes, really, for the one underneath. You can probably gather that that is Florence Nightingale. Who is that? And how does this apparently um, suave gentleman, military gentleman, fit into this tale? Mm, not quite, no. So, the doctor and the nurse. This is the doctor. 
This is the nurse. The nurse is Florence Nightingale. The doctor was known as James Barry. A military doctor, decorated major, surgeon general of the army, served with huge distinction, hated by Florence Nightingale, whom he upbraided from the seat of his horse, refusing to come down and talk to her as an equal. And she later recorded in her diary that this was one of the most misogynistic and arrogant men that she had ever had the unfortunate misfortune to set eyes upon. So it was a quite a shock to the establishment of the day when on the death of James Barry, James Barry was discovered to be female. And that essentially was the length to which people had to go if you were female to gain a medical degree. Two more faces for you to try. See how you do with those two. Any takers? <laughs> Correct. Well done. <laughs> there are no prizes, I'm afraid. <laughs> the top one is Elizabeth Garrett Anderson. The bottom one is her comrade in uh, arms, so to speak, Sophia Jex Blake, of whom more anon. Remember the name Jex Blake, because it's going to crop up in our story again in a minute. So Elizabeth Garrett Anderson wasn't really able or willing to go through the rigours of James Barry's um, route and uh, had a, a couple of uh, failed attempts to gain a medical degree from major medical schools. Um, however, she did manage to enrol for a nursing course at the Westminster, where she <coughs> quickly realised that there wasn't, uh, not the Westminster, sorry, the Middlesex where she quickly realised that actually the rules for students didn't specify that you, which lectures you could go to. So she contrived to, as a nurse, turn up to all of the doctor lectures as well, which was all going very well, and nobody was actually particularly concerned about it. Until one day, the um, professor asked a question of a packed lecture theatre, Nobody could say anything because nobody knew the answer except her. And she was foolish enough to give the answer. Whereupon she was hauled in front of the principal and promptly terminated. They didn't muck about it those days. Uh, but she sort of had the last laugh because she did a little bit more research and she said, well, OK, I've got the education now. Uh, what I need to do is get the qualification. And so what she did was she read she discovered that there was this organisation called the Apothecaries, who, the Apothecaries were kind of a, they were a guild, um, worshipful company of Apothecaries, was a, a, a guild in the city of London, um, and they were kind of like pharmacists on steroids, because they were kind of a cross between a GP and a pharmacist. The distinction came that a, a doctor would charge for the consultation, whereas an apothecary would charge for the medicine. But within that distinction, they were actually effectively GPs because they were allowed to consult and to diagnose and to then produce a script. And this is, of course, the origin of the tradition that we still have where a trip to the GP results in a prescription because, of course, that was how the, the apothecary got paid. But they had an examination called the LSA which effectively licensed you to practice medicine, and on which there was no bar for women sitting the exam. And Elizabeth Garrett Anderson popped onto the apothecaries and sat the exam and passed at the first attempt. The apothecaries hastily closed the loophole so that no further women could do this. So Sophia Jex Blake had to uh, adopt a slightly different um, technique and unable to go to Apothecary's Hall, she had to go slightly further afield and she went to Bern. And she got a medical degree from the University of Bern, who had no problem with giving her one. And then she came back to the United Kingdom and following a change in the law, uh, was able to sit the licentiate uh, at the Queen Kings and Queens College of Physicians in Ireland. So she became medically qualified, and together 
they decided that they were going to do something to stop this happening again. And they founded the London Medical School for Women at what is the Royal Free Hospital. Uh, and, um, well, they became quite successful. And they, their female graduates, carved out quite distinguished careers. But within a slightly limited field of medicine, it tended to be general practice and obstetrics and gynaecology. But it's interesting to um, speculate on the the um, influences that drove those first women to, to take up medical study. And one has to possibly think that some of the conditions that were regularly being witnessed at the time as a result of the wars that were going on and as a result of the social deprivation of the times probably had quite a lot of influence on this. And it was actually a popular thing with the, the general public, a bit like now where we're having a bit of a problem with our Secretary of State for Health and the general public generally seem to be quite supportive. Um, in those days, the, the establishment were a bit sort of up in arms about this new phenomenon of women doctors, but actually there were a lot of women who were very grateful for them. And Teresa Billington Gregg, who is a, quite a famous feminist, was writing, busy writing articles like the one I've put up there, which I won't read in full because it's very long, basically saying women doctors are a good thing. And, and the newspapers were publishing this. So what really changed everything was the First World War. Because, of course, suddenly we had a huge, uh, massive increase in the amount of, of, of wounded and people needing medical attention. And at the same time, most of the likely candidates for medical training were being hoovered up and sent to the front to die. So they became casualties themselves. And uh, the army was so desperate for doctors that the medical schools were not able to provide that the army issued an instruction to their paymasters that any woman who was prepared to serve as a doctor in the army should do so on equal pay with their male counterparts, which was almost unheard of. Meanwhile, at St George's, we got to St George's at last. Meanwhile at St George's, they were slightly preoccupied with other matters because there were this is, this, this is sort of, nothing ever changes. They were fighting a rear guard action against the possibility that they could be forcibly amalgamated by the University of London with a number of other medical schools, um, mainly UCL, effectively. It was actually, um, I think it was the Westminster at that point. Anyway, um, then out of the blue, suddenly they came up with a bright idea. Why don't we try admitting women students? That will fill our numbers. And they promptly passed a motion, all enthusiastic, that that's what they were going to do. And the result is five women rocked up. No, you can't really see that. That's a bit of a shame. Um, anyway, they were Helen Ingleby, Hetty Ethelberta Claremont, Marion Bostock, Elizabeth O'Flynn, and Dorothy Daintree. Now, the St George's Hospital Gazette of the time suggests that the new students were welcomed with open arms. However, the truth is slightly different. Uh, they were treated with suspicion, in some cases open hostility, by male students and members of the faculty who paraded up and down Hyde Park with banners on the day they arrived and resulted in Dorothy Daintree uh, getting out of her cab walking around the back of the cab and getting back in her cab and going back to where she'd come from. And she indeed continued her studies at the London Medical School for Women and we know that she did actually graduate from there. And eventually she became a doctor with the Baptist Missionary Society and she went and worked in a hospital in Bangalore. So, this leaves us with four. And here are our four, well, three of them anyway. Um, Helen Ingleby on the top. Our first female graduate, Ethelberta Claremont, Elizabeth O'Flynn, bit of a mystery woman. I haven't found a photograph of her. And Marion Bostock. That's a very sh small girl, but that's the best photograph I can find. So, Helen Ingleby was the daughter of a squire. He was um, MP for King's Lynn. Uh, she was quite an 
edu well educated. She went out and served as a medical orderly in France, in a hospital on the Western Front. Uh, she had fluent German, which was not uncommon in those days for people of the upper middle classes, because uh, she'd had a German governess and she also spoke French. So she would have been quite useful in a hospital as a hospital orderly. Um, then we've got Ethelberta Claremont. Now, Ethelberta Claremont was the daughter of uh, leading lawyer Albert William Claremont and the granddaughter <coughs> of this gentleman, Dr. Claude Claremont. Um, and uh, the Claremont family were very active in a new uh, educational movement called the Montessori movement. Um, and Mrs. Claremont had become involved in the foundation of King Alfred's school. Uh, now, uh, King Alfred School in Hampstead it was a, 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 not a Montessori school, but it was run along similar grounds in that it believed in co-education of boys and girls with no distinctions as to who could do what subject. Um, and in that environment, Ethelberta seems to have thrived. I don't know if you can see it there, it may be obscured, but she was captain of the cricket, there we are, games captain, Ethelberta Cla Claremont. Um, and uh, she went on to become head of school, and uh, then later on, when she had qualified as a doctor, she um, went on to become a major benefactor for the school, and in fact, one of the things that this building here, which is one of the original school buildings on the site, on the, the, their new site, the site was paid for and purchased for the school by Ethelberta Claremont. So uh, there we go. Now, Elizabeth O'Finn um, is a little bit of a mystery. I don't know very much about her. And if anybody does, I'd like to... I know that she came from the London Medical School for Women. Prior to that, I don't really know anything about her. So, Claremont and the other th uh, three students uh, who elected to start at St George's, didn't have an easy time. Here's their report cards, which are still downstairs in the uh, St George's archive, a point that you may wish to consider. <laughs> um, there are quite a lot of records kept of previous students, illustrious students too. Uh, for example, um, Valentine Logue came to St George's. Uh, his report card is down there as well. He was the son of, um, of Lionel Logue, who was the speech therapist to cured um, King George. So there we go. Um, so yeah, they, they didn't have an easy time and basically their presence became a perpetual ba battleground uh, for the Medical School Management Committee. And indeed we now come to the part of the story which as a current student of St George's I, I find quite amusing. Bear with me, I'll explain that rather curious comment in a moment because what actually happened was undoubtedly unfortunate and nearly catastrophic to the women students. Um, in June 1915, the women students, now halfway through their, their trial three months, uh, a further meeting was held to dis decide on their future, uh, which almost resulted in their immediate termination because the hospital management, uh, the um, medical school management committee decided that no, they, they, they should their studies should be ended. Uh, the uh, women appealed very eloquently. There is the letter that they wrote, which is also in the archive. Uh, and this was duly cons con uh, considered at the July meeting. Uh, they, they wrote, we feel we are gaining so much from our work at St George's. We're so highly appreci appreciative of the privilege of being here that we had looked forward to being able to allow us to, to complete our studies for qualification at this school and are keenly disappointed that we are not to be allowed to do so. Well, the result of that was a compromise. Uh, St George's Hospital, uh, St George's Management Committee, St Medical School Management Committee decided that uh, the four could continue but there were to be no further women admitted to St George's. You could almost hear them say ever, ever, ever afterwards. Uh, however, remember I said that uh, as a modern St George's student I find this part of the tale slightly amusing. And that's because, supremely, this little episode shows that some things never really seem to change very much. 
Uh, those of us who have the privilege to study and work here know that um, at times St George's can be, let's just say, a teeny bit forgetful in its internal communications. And what happened next shows that this isn't entirely a new phenomenon. Because somehow there must have been a mix-up on Moodle, or the memo got wrongly classified, or uh, it's junk mail, or something. And um, nobody appears to have told the admissions team, with the result that in uh, 1917, from the ledgers, we can tell that 20 further women <laughs> had been admitted to the school. So nothing really changes. In fact, in fairness, it wasn't quite as random as I, I've uh, just suggested. Uh, oh, hang on. Um, it is indicative of the kind of internal conflict and uncertainty that the issue was provoking at all sorts of levels. Uh, with successive decisions and reversals of policy over a period of about 18 months. During this time, the women students found a staunch ally in Dr. Jex Blake. Remember that name from earlier? Yes. So, Dr. Jex Blake. And now, he's often been... Sophia Jex Blake by this time was long, in the, long since in the ground. And the medical historians that have looked through the archive papers have often speculated as to what the connection between him and Sophia Jex Blake was. And indeed who he was, because it's not easy to see at first glance. Well, I did a bit more digging and I found a signature, A.J. Jex Blake, you can see that. And I then did some more digging in another archive and I found that he was actually Dr. Arthur John Jex Blake. He was a, dedica uh, a decorated World War I Army Major and he was indeed the nephew of Sophia Jex Blake. And he went on to become a major champion of women within St George's. Now, his motives for doing so, we can only speculate. Um, in his obituary, it's recorded that he uh, basically used to uh, introduce himself to people saying, yes, I'm the nephew of Dr. Sophia Louisa Jex Blake and the brother of the principal of Lady Margaret Hall, Oxford, and of the mistress of Girton College. After this, the question had lost interest in him. So he may perhaps have had a slight feeling of inadequacy, I don't know, but either way, he behaved in a very supportive manner. And thanks to his patronage, very soon we didn't only have medical female medical students but we also had members of staff uh, according to um, her student record uh, helen ingleby became qualified in january 1916 having studied for just one year here uh, and in march that year applied for the post of assistant curator of the museum to which she was duly appointed now she seems to have had a pretty monumental and meteoric rise from assistant curator of the museum uh, to her next post of which more in a moment now a selection a section of the hospital accounts for 1916 reveals a considerable discrepancy between the rates of pay afforded to women doctors in st george's uh, and men doing similar jobs because the november the second ledger records records of expenditure as follows salary for whole time male officer 400 pounds Salary for whole-time women officer, £100. Budget in respect of the new venereal diseases department, which had just been set up. Interestingly, that's a stark contrast to the army, who, as I told you earlier, were offering equal rates of pay. But what the army didn't have was the promotion prospects that St George's Hospital offered. And by 1917, we not only had women doctors we had a female surgical and medical registrar because uh, Hetty Ethelberta Claremont had decided to specialize as a surgeon and she be became the first surgical registrar at the same time Dr Helen Ingleby became the first female medical registrar of the hospital. Now interest incidentally while we're on this part of the story. Let me just mention a smaller side which amused me when I was browsing through the archives because Helen Ingleby had become the leader of her student year group 
Um, and um, as somebody who my, had myself the privilege last year of serving as two year rep and organising the fabled halfway dinner for students, I was quite amused to come across a handwritten letter from Helen Engleby um, to the then Dean requesting permission to organise the first subscription dinner for clinical year medical students at the Park Lane Hotel on almost the same date as we had our halfway dinner some hundred years later. So I don't know, was she the first, the organiser of the first ever tea year dinner? Uh, it's possible. And I like to think that she was. Anyway, anybody who thought that, um, that the, uh, f uh, having a female surgical registrar would be um, a bit of a pushover, I mean, surgeons are known for being quite robust, um, didn't know Ethelberta Claremont because she got very quickly stuck into her post and made quite a name for herself. She came up with the first system of um, basically cataloguing s medical records indexed by a hospital number and date of admission, date of birth and so on. The sort of thing you would do with a modern database. Now, previous to this, they just all the records had just been written in a book as they happened and there was no continuity. So that you'd have a book for the ward and all the patients on that ward had all their records put in that same book. And you'd have to flick through the book to find it. She was the one who introduced the first system whereby a patient had a file and in that file you had everything to hand that pertained to that patient. Which probably explains why um, she became a full FRCS by the age of 27, which is quite an achievement. Well, it wasn't long before the medical schools of London realised that actually they needed to sort this out. And they, uh, they basically, St George's convened a meeting with the other um, medical schools. Uh, now, the interesting thing about this is that the um, tenor of the whole thing had changed in just a couple of years from the point of which when George's was the first London medical school to admit women, there was mutterings about how unwise this policy was. And just before this conference, one of the major pieces, um, there was a major spat between the principal of King's and the principal of St George's because King's wanted to complain that St George's were taking too many women students and depriving other medical schools of the opportunity to have some. So there was a bit of a change of the wind blowing from a different direction. Anyway, St George's hastily uh, convened a conference, even if slightly after the fact, because Helen Ingleby, of course, had already become an MRCP and Ethel Better Claremont was well on the, on the way to becoming an FRCS by then. But the agenda was the admission of women and basically what the policy of the medical schools was going to be for, for the future. Now, the irony of this is that actually the foundation principle of the University of London was equality of education. And so in some ways, the medical schools were putting themselves out on a limb against the rest of the University of London, because the whole principle of the University of London was that whereas Oxford and Cambridge, for example, said, well, no, we don't admit women to degrees, London always had. And in fact, the compromise that was hammered out in the case of my ancestor, Charlotte Angus Scott, was that when she sat the Cambridge Tripos and embarrassed Cambridge University by actually passing it, they wouldn't give her a degree, but they arranged for London University to issue her a degree. And that had been the sort of time on a compromise. So now, um, the conference was convened, it duly reported, and um, in effect, the, um, the co compromise that they arrived at was that some colleges would continue to admit women, some would not, some would admit women for preclinical years only, some would admit women for clinical years only. In effect, the principle had been won. Uh, and there was a particularly vexed question of the provision 
of a lady tutor to advise women students in regard to some of the matters on which the dean normally advises male students. This in the current day seems a little quaint because of course we have a female principal and until Deborah Bowman departs a female dean of studies so it's um, <laughs> a little bit antiquated from the modern perspective. Um, but the, sub the, the point was that the principal had been won. Now Perhaps it's slightly ironic, therefore, that actually what then happened was that actually with the close of the First World War, St George's didn't admit any more women and in fact would not do so for another 30 years until 1947. Um, and then the principal, as the Gazette lovely shows, is the principal worry was the provision of suitable toilets. Anyway, uh, of course, according to the published figures now, the, yeah, currently 62% of medical students at St George's are female. So, um, what happened to our four? Well, papers in the uh, National Archive indicate that uh, Helen Ingleby went on to rise to become uh, the Professor of Pathology at a women's medical college in uh, Pennsylvania, Phil Philadelphia. Prior to that, she was working with a, a guy called C. Defano on, um, to use her own uh, words, she was working on neuralgia, an investigation of perivascular and pericellular spaces by Weed's Prussian blue method, combining it, if possible, with special glia stains. Uh, it's, it's, there are quite a lot of her papers in the National Archive. Um, Ethelberta Claremont as I told you, went on to become an FRCS at the age of 27 with an international reputation. Uh, she won, while at St George's, she won the Hot Hunter Gold Medal uh, and she served as a surgical registrar, as we know, with distinction. She wrote several papers, shortening of post-operative convalescence, in, published in The Lancet in 1922, and pylorus obstructing gastrojejunoscopy aperture in 1923. Um, now, such was her change of fortunes that from the time when she had graduated when the Royal College of Surgeons had done their utmost to prevent her from becoming a surgeon, um, by the time she died as a full consultant surgeon with an international reputation, she uh, basically the Royal College um, put out an appeal for blood because what had happened was that she had come back from her international career and she had begun to do uh, charitable work in the mission hospitals of East, uh, the East End of London and from one of her patients she contracted typhus which killed her. Um, so she thus has the, uh, the distinction, the strange distinction of not only becoming the first woman FRCS, but the first, also the first woman to die as a result of her medical practice. And the Royal College of Surgeons put out an got, got appeal to the BBC to put out an appeal for blood to save her life. Unfortunately, the blood arrived a few hours too late. Um, and she died. But uh, her obituary, uh, the she was the, the college were quite clear that they regarded her as one of the brightest young surgeons of her age. So she was a great loss. Elizabeth O'Flynn. Now she went on to have a respectable career uh, in um, pathology. She initially uh, worked for the uh, Queen, the National Hospital for the Paralysed and Epileptics in Queen Square and she went on to become the pathologist for the Marylebone District for quite a while before she married Sir Thomas Stanton uh, but when she died uh, her um, obituary was written by no less than Cuthbert Dukes of Dukes Scale which those of you interested in bowel cancer will probably remember. So I think you're probably doing something right if, you, if, if Cuthbert Jukes writes your obituary, actually. 
Marion Bostock, uh, less is recorded about her. She basically became uh, she became a surgeon and she went out and worked with the Zeneca Bible and Med Medical Society, serving as uh, the chief surgeon of the Duchess of Tech Hospital in Patna. And then in 1928, she married Victor Sherman, retiring to Canada, where they lived, and she did a lot of work with the Canadian Humanist Movement, for which she received a, a medal just before she died. So, in retrospect, while none of the St George's women might have made earth-shattering discoveries, they all went on to have pretty solid careers and made solid contributions to the practice of medicine and the provision of good, excellent patient care. Now, looking back from the perspective of 2016, it may seem slightly strange to us, a hundred years on, that there was ever any question that this would be the case. Now, fittingly, St George's makes some very positive contributions now to the widening of diversity of those trained for medical practice. In recent years, they've worked hard to reach people who come from less affluent backgrounds, as the student ambassadors, of course, go out and encourage people from um, less academic backgrounds to consider medicine as a career. Um, and they've also done work, St George's, when I applied to medicine, was one of the medical schools that was most keen to stress that there should be, that age should be no bar to medical training. And of course we know also that they have very strong policies on LGBT matters and they have been uh, instrumental in encouraging people from lesbian, gay and even transgender communities to train. Now, speaking of somebody who fits into at least uh, two of those categories, I think obviously this is an extremely good thing because medicine is strengthened when it recruits to its ranks people with diverse life experience. So I started with a biblical quotation, it seems fitting to end with one, because if the Bible was used wrongly to justify the subjection of women, it only demonstrates how myopic uh, humanity can become. Because had the readers of the book of Timothy merely turned a few pages back in their Bible, they would have found ample justification for a more liberal approach in these words from the book of Galatians. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, in my opinion, the point is well made in respect of medicine as well, because a good doctor must always be a doctor first and foremost. Thank you. And if anybody has any awkward questions, I will do my best to answer them for you. <laughs> I just, uh, did you say that the Royal Free was the first all... Uh, the London Medical... The London, yes, the London Medical School for Women was, was founded around the Royal Free Hospital. Right. Yes. And um, as I understand, I may be wrong here, the Royal Free was called the Royal Free because they offered free burials for patients who died there. Is that... Is that uh, myth or is that true? I don't know, is the short answer <laughs> to your question. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the um, administrative era that is so uh, classic of St. George's, where a further 20 women were admitted. Mm -hmm. um, were they allowed to study or not? Oh, yes, absolutely. So no, no, the, no, that went, the that went ahead. 20, and then it was stopped for 30 years. Is that yes, right? then it was stopped for 30 years. Right. And it was a, it was a, you know, I mean, there was, there was a bit of a thing that it, it was a bit stop go. One week they'd have a meeting and they decide that they wanted more women, and the next week meet, meeting, the other lot would turn up, and 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 they'd say, no, 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 we don't want any of these women, and the, I think the admissions tutors just said, oh, I'm just going to do what I want. <laughs> it, it may have been, sorry, it may have been the case that women weren't very good at rugby. And they needed good rugby players. Well, now, it's funny you should mention that, but that actually, you are entirely correct. There is some evidence in some of the minutes of the meeting to suggest that one of the questions that was raised was indeed, 
what would happen to the rugby club, what would happen to the rowing club. Now, seen from the perspective of now, that seems faintly quaint, because of course people will be aware that the women's rugby and the women's rowing teams of St George's have actually enjoyed some considerable sporting success. And I may be slightly on dodgy ground, but I think in some cases they've actually enjoyed some better success than the male team. So it probably proves that you, you know, you should never be too hasty to judge these things. I think when, I think, I think certainly in the early 1970s it was one of the criteria for men coming here that they could mm. play rugby and, mm. and they But I think with regard to 1916, I think that the army um, they had hired the had raised the age uh, range of recruiting men to the war because they'd lost so many men mm. that they were accepting soldiers who were older. And it may have had some influence to the sort of bending of the restriction on women coming in because there were so many people being killed on the Western Front and they needed more doctors, especially you know, to take care of people in the, in the convalescent homes. Indeed. People had been gassed. So Indeed. Much that they needed many more doctors. Indeed. Have they, at what point, or if ever, did they get round to revoking the point of saying no doctors? Have they actually written it down somewhere and say, hey, women can be doctors now? Yes, no, the, 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 um, the 1917 conference, that was the point of the 1917 conference, it finally settled the question author authoritatively for um, the... London medical schools and the decision was that that women could be doctors but that colleges had the right to exercise their own discretion as to who they admitted which was a sort of fudge <laughs> agree the principle and then blur it all over with a nice but effectively it allowed people to do whatever they wanted and that's basically what happened um, and as I say, the rest is history. I find it interesting that the Royal Free was so uh, welcoming to introduce female medical students. I know from a friend of mine that they uh, allowed the first male nurse to train there in 1977. <laughs> That's that quite interesting, isn't it? That's female, female school. school. <laughs> Colin, what's here? Uh, I, yep. I know um, I trained here in 1972 as a nurse, and we had three men in the intake, there were 60 of us. There were 60 twice a year, and there were about two to three men in each intake. Yeah. But they were, it was only, I think after the, there was a big sex discrimination act in the 70s, and it was only when, uh, he's actually a professional trumpet player and a nurse, very good friend of mine. Um, it was only when he bothered to apply, and they suddenly stepped back and said, gosh, this sex discrimination act, we better let him in, really, haven't we? <laughs> 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 and yet, we have these women fighting yep. uh, the other way. So it's, it's interesting times, I think. Interesting century. Right. For yes, absolutely. Sexuality very medicine. strange. Um, they had some very strange ideas in those days. And, you know, I wonder you. sometimes what people will look back on us and think, whoa, they had some weird ideas. <laughs> but at least we have one entry gate when my sister applied to do medicine in the second world. A big disparity between my age and my sister's age mm. um, because there were two families uh, my father's early life and later life, extreme later life. And um, she had to have double the A levels, she had to have double the level of double the number of matriculations to get in mm. um, to train. So she had to have six, and everybody and the men had three <laughs> A grades or A style mm, grades. Sense. So she had to do double the number to get into medical school and was turned down twice. So interesting. And she became a haematologist in 1952. Good for her. Well, one other small point. The um, officer that Florence Nightingale objected to was Dr. Barry, I think. Yes, James um, Barry. Yes. James Miranda Barry, to be <laughs> precise. <laughs> <laughs> Clue is in the second name, but there you go. He was never found to be female during his life. Precisely. No. And he, and no. He, but he behaved 
presumably like any male officer would behave. Indeed. <laughs> and completely. Also very, very chauvinistic as yes. well. Yes. <laughs> totally chauvinistic and completely, you know, an, an, an insufferable gentleman, as, as, as Florence Nightingale said. His photograph seemed showed him to be very feminine looking. Yes, that's right. But I think the, from what I've read, the, the trick was that he or she uh, compensated for the uh, slightly effete look by having this rumbustious, bombastic personality that kind of made everybody think, oh, all right, not going to argue. <laughs> <laughs> I want to keep my head attached to my body, thank you. Because this was before the days of testosterone. You know. mm, well, very much, probably, yeah, you know. indeed. Perhaps she had the short man syndrome and that's why she wouldn't get up by horse. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's always possible, I suppose. And I think Florence Nightingale probably, uh, you know, probably had a very good... I mean, Florence Nightingale, from what I've heard, was not um, exactly the easiest person to get on with, so... As long as you kept the pillowcases fair. away from the windows, which we still do now to get the scorpions out. If you make a bed in a teaching hospital, you must keep the pillowcase away. away from the yes. window. How fascinating! The scorpions can't use doors, apparently. Yeah, I'm not making this up, all right. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have a, when I was at Hyde Park Corner, we didn't have problems with scorpions there. Not, not, not too many scorpions <laughs> in Hyde Park Corner, no, no. <laughs> So there we are. I think that's probably a, a good place to stop. Apart from anything else, I want some curry or something. <laughs> so I hope you. I hope. I hope you. Uh, thank you very much all for coming and supporting this. And uh, I hope you find your time has not been wasted. <laughs>